So, hello everyone, uh, I'm Sam, and I'm here to talk about today uh, Octopath Traveler, uh, a game I played over the summer and immediately fell in love with. So today in particular, I'd like to talk about the storytelling and the world building of this game, how those are used, and what the game's philosophy is on those two topics. Before we go into too much detail though, I want to make sure that we're clear on what those terms particularly mean. Um, so storytelling and world building, they're commonly used in a lot of fictional media whether it be like books, like um, any science fiction particularly, um, any board, um, board games, things like D&D and the like, pretty much any sort of media will use these two things. For our purposes, we're going to define it like this. Storytelling, that on your, like whatever the protagonist is, or you, whatever your main goal is, anything that is like towards that goal or any quest that serves to meet that in, um, final end, we're going to consider that a part of the storytelling. Let's take, for instance, um, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Defeating Ganon is pretty much the goal, ultimate goal of the game. So anything you do along the way, like getting um, those, I, um, those figurines, those um, crystals, whatever, that lets you get the Master Sword, that would be considered part of the story. It's part of the storytelling, because it's immediately part of your quest. On the other hand, we also have something called what we'll say world building. This refers pretty much to everything else, things like the lore or just the world in general that goes beyond your quest. For instance, let's say, actually we'll stick to the Ocarina of Time example, um, the Big Orange Sword quest. There's like, you have these nice um, few fetch quests that get you this really good weapon. They will help you defeat Ganon, but that's not like the main, like it's not part of your main path there. It helps you, it lets you explore a bit more of the world, which is pretty cool, but it's not directly part of the full story. So a couple um, examples of this, we'll, um, let's take these pretty popular JRPGs, like Bravely Default, Final Fantasy, Tales of Funyan. A lot of these really have storytelling as the main focus of their games. Let's, we'll take them one by one. Bravely Default, your goal is to restore the four crystals and save the world. Final Fantasy, restore the four crystals and save the world. I'm detecting a pattern here. Um, Tales of Symphonia, it's like you have to like Honestly, I haven't even played through the full game, but like you've got to like go um, go through these like pray at some temples, think Skyward Sword in terms of that, and a bunch of other stuff, random habits. But its main goal is the story. Like you'll go around, and explore the world, we'll learn more about it. But the main the main goal of it, the main way that it really uh, captures the players is through its story, through its characters, and really just making you invested in their journey. On the other hand, we have Octopath Traveler, which I believe really, instead of using its story and its like and that one line as its main focus, it uses its world building as the main thing to draw the players in. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail as to why that is, why I think that, and why I think it works so well. Um, first, let's talk about the character stories, because even though that it, do, like, it does have an end goal, like, well, kind of, sort of. So, First, I think it'd be helpful if I explain the premise of the game in case anyone uh, hasn't played before. Also, as a warning, there will be spoilers during this presentation, so keep that in mind as you're watching this or whatever it may be. So you have eight different characters um, that you can play as. They, you can basically match them um, whatever you want as your party. And they each have their own separate four chapter stories. You can do them in whatever order you want. You can pick them up and have them join your party in whatever order you want. There's so much freedom that the game gives you in terms of how you interact with them and their stories. But because they're all separate, there's no like singular end goal for the game. Like there's no one big bad during the main story. There kind of is, but that's like post game. You don't really hear about that till like 80 hours in, so I'm not even gonna count that. But so in a sense, it, that's like already a start, that it doesn't have a main end goal, so it gives a lot of freedom to just move around and to have a bunch of different areas and a bunch of different ways of exploring the world. Um, so, I want, next, uh, first thing I want to talk about is this complete freedom that the game gives you. You'll start off with one character, you do their chapter one, and the game's like, okay, have fun, explore the world as you choose. And so, this kind of storytelling doesn't work quite well for like the previous form of storytelling we were talking about where there's one end goal because if you have all these options it becomes very hard to account for okay if the player does this then this that linear path that linear way of storytelling doesn't work but it helps you a lot for world building and, and exploring that way 
of really capturing the, re um, the player. Because when you have all these different, uh, if these different storylines, the, um, the player will be like, huh, I'm curious maybe about this person's, like this area over here, so let me try exploring this. Or they might be like, huh, I'm curious about this person's backstory. You'll play that chapter. Find out about a couple of the other characters. Um, and it really just gives a, the player the freedom to explore the world, and it really makes sure that the world is the reason that they're continuing to play the game. And even the locations of these different chapters really encourage that sort of exploration and, and just really world as the focus sort of gameplay. So this is actually the map of the first um, few chapters of the game. All these um, white town images, those are all the chapter one locations. With all these green ones, uh, those indicate the chapter two locations for each character. Beyond that, I mean, the same rules apply, but um, um, but it's a, it's a similar idea, so we don't need to map those out. So let's notice actually the location of these first chapters. They're very central towards the map, which makes it very easy for the player to just say, okay, I'm in the central location, so I can go in one of these many different directions. And so that really encourages the player to be like, I could go this way, or I could go this way, or I could go this way. It makes that sort of, um, the player can do whatever they want and really explore the world as they choose. And then we see that the green, um, the green locations, the chapter twos, are a little bit more further out, um, which makes it easy for um, the player to be like, okay, I'm here, I'm in this sort of more outward land, which is pretty cool. I can go even further maybe and explore some of the more, the far reaches of the world. Or maybe I can go back and explore some of the other places. So it makes it really easy for the player to explore whatever they chose to choose. And one other thing that we should notice is that actually two characters actually have their chapter choose in the same town. One of the really cool things that this does is it allows the player to see a town from multiple perspectives. Because, for instance, the, um, in this case, the merchant character is not going to go town for the same reason that a scholar is going to go to that same place. And so it allows, you, it allows the talent to really feel alive. It just gives it a lot more depth, and it allows the player to really see all sides of these many different towns. Um, and then, so on and so forth. I, like, the chapter three town will actually pretty much be in these similar regions, and by the time you hit the chapter four, so you'll be like in the far edges of the continent. So by the time you get those last chapters, you'll pretty much have explored the entire continent. So the next thing I want to talk about are the endings. Well, the story endings, quote unquote, but that's not quite accurate in a sense because they feel more like, like, like the ending of a character arc, not necessarily a story. Because each of these, even though each of these um, stories play out independently of one another, all the endings, like they just draw little loose ends that connect them to other parts of other character stories. And that really makes the player, it makes the player want to think, huh, how do these things connect? These similar terms, these cryptic messages, whatever it may be, they just give these little loose ends that make the player want to see more and want to learn more about the lore, the backstory, and the, just all the mythos of the world. So a couple of my favorite examples of this, um, the first one is Cyrus, the scholar. His ending pretty much consists of, of him finding these ancient ruins that have these murals, these very dark murals that like depicting pretty much an Armageddon-like event. It talks about some sort of calamity, but if this is the first time you've heard it, you like the player will have no idea what these things mean, what they're referring to. Is it even relevant, or is it just some interesting backstory? Because for a first, if that's the first time you complete, you're like, I don't know, this is cool and all. He's a researcher; it's like natural to find out more about the history and all that. So the player might just brush off as whatever. Um, the other example that I found really interesting is I, um, Alfin is the apothecary of the game, so just the traveling medicine man pretty much, and Tressa is the traveling merchant of the game. Both of those actually share a much more explicit connection because there is a character that is um, alluded to, and first in Alfin, um, his name is Graham Crossford, who's pretty much this, like, he's, he was another traveling apothecary way back when. He saved Alfin's life, which caused him to go on his traveling, so on and so forth. And Tressa's beginning, it begins with her getting a notebook um, that, uh, that talks about all these different lands, these distant lands that want to uh, encourage her to go and explore. A notebook owned by the one and only Graham Crossford. And so completing both these chapters, the player will um, start to think, wait, there's a connection here. What's, like, that 
that's like the first red flag for the player. It's like, okay, there is something more to this person. Because we never meet this character during the game, during like the main part of the game. And so it really makes the player want to go out, explore more, talk to more people, find out what they can about this character. Actually, I guess going back to Cyrus once more, because there's one detail I forgot to mention, is that on those murals that I mentioned earlier, there is a place, a term, one called the Gate of Venice, which ends up being the final area of the game, but the player at the time doesn't know any of that. But that same term is brought up in two other character stories. Uh, those two characters are Ulbrich, the warrior, and Therian, uh, the thief of the campaign. Each of them appear both in completely different contexts by like, um, one from like a legend surrounding these gemstones he was trying to steal back, and the other from pretty much a fellow warrior that he ends up uh, killing in the end because he was evil and, you know, uh, um, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so you, you get these, these nice loose ends that hint towards a connection that make the player want to continue more, really want to learn more about the characters, and well, not even about the characters, but about the mythos, the world, and just the backstory, that you don't get that as much from a storytelling um, uh, style, uh, um, but more from a world building, learning about the religion and all that sort of stuff. One other thing these endings do is that they don't give finality or conclusion to the side characters. Because, and then, uh, like these separate characters that'll help your protagonist on the way. It'll, like, they'll do their thing and then they'll do off whatever else is part of their lives. They have their lives outside the protagonist. And it'll make the player wonder, huh, I wonder what happened to those people. And as you go about exploring more, you'll find them in these different towns that you've been to before. They'll have their side quests. You can help them see what, like, what sort of conclusions they have to their own stories. Uh, and this is actually what I want to touch on next, these side quests. Um, that those significant side characters, they, ha I mean, they have their own stories. They have their own separate, really cool arcs of their own. These are a couple I actually want to touch on um, myself. These are a couple of my favorites. Ali the Merchant, um, he was pretty much the rival merchant of Tressa, your protagonist character. And pretty much the thing that sets him on his journey is like this view of his father, he wants to become a virgin and not be in the shadow of his own father. And you do his side quest, and you see him finally come to terms and like finally make up with his father, with his family, and really begin to start a new back at home. Which is a nice touching thing that the game itself will encourage you to do by just kind of hinting at, oh hey, bye, you finish your adventure, I'm gonna go finish mine and whatnot. Which is kind of cool, but it's not even required. It doesn't, and it gives you a pay reward, but it's just cool to see these characters find their own conclusions. One other neat thing is seeing characters from completely different, that you know from completely different contexts, from two people's very different stories. And they just know each other. They have, again, lives outside of the protagonist scene. So in this case, um, Cordelia and Noah are two nobles, um, two princesses um, in the, on the continent. One of them, and you know from completely different campaigns. But you can do a side quest, I think, for Cordelia that lets you bring the two together and just like have them meet up in person again. Which is kind of cool, because they know each other beforehand, and you just get to see like all the characters, they feel alive. Be like they have they have depth to them, they have just these their own stories, which is just cool, and that's a really cool approach that I really like that Octopath takes during the game. And of course you have a bunch of different side quests for like these random NPCs, not just your major characters, that give them a little bit more of a touch. But that's something that most JRPGs do. But I think Octopath Traveler does it in a way that really makes every character feel like they have their own story. And I think that's the thing that makes me really love um, Octopath Traveler, is that not only is focused on your main characters, like, it does have a focus there, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is learning about everyone in the world, about the whole region as a whole, like what was the history behind it. Like those sort of big picture story piece, things of storytelling, I think that's what really engages me uh, as a player. Of course, this is something that's different for everyone, and that's actually why I want to take a little bit to discuss about it. And I'm sure that you've all had your own experiences playing games, whether they be video games, um, tabletop games, or have, even like reading a book or watching TV or whatever it may have been. Like what sort of 
I think, whether it be storytelling or world making, has really caused you to get, like, really, um, caused you to really love a sort of, like, a, me a sort of media. So, I'll open the floor to any sort of thoughts that any of you may have. Ruby? Hey, Sam. What's Hi, up? Um, so, something I really like about world building, and something I really appreciate, we were talking earlier about Avatar, The Last yeah. Airbender. And um, something I really like in its world building is is how is like when so like so, so something you should always ask in like any kind of work of whatever is to ask why. No, 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 not Blue Aliens Avatar. Avatar the Last Airbender. No, Avatar the Last. Yes. So uh, something an important question I always ask is like why did the creator set it up this way? Like why is like why is the history work out like this? And in Avatar, like The Last Airbender, I like the world building because they, 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 they set it up to ask, no, not just to further the plot, but to also say meaningful things about the world, whether it's direct parallels to real life colonialism, or like trying to say things about how people relate to each other in terms of nationality, culture, and religion. So if you want to draw the whole, like, what is the philosophy, or what is the moral, or the theme of the story, how do you think world building intersects with that? Like, do you think it, it's it's more like do you think it 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 has to be more simple more simple than oh you know like in the blue aliens avatar you know the humans represent America and the blue people represent the Iraqis and it's the Iraq War you know like does it ha can it just be that or does it have to be more complex? Um, I think it's, I mean, it sort of depends. I feel like on what the creators are trying to get across. Like you mentioned that sort of symbolism that the con that's to the world building can give. And I think that's like the big thing is that world building in a lot of, is great for creating context. Mm -hmm. And that's um you're so you're talking about symbolism, the world building create that context for those parallels to be made. But it can um, but it can give context for completely other different things. I'm trying to think of an example. Right? I mean, I mean, for instance, in Octopath Traveler, I think that it's not saying the context that it is the focus, in that the storytelling almost prevent, like, provides the context for the world, if that sort of makes sense. Um, then there are, actually, and there are plenty of other um, examples that we can use. Like, what's one that really, I mean, actually, you know, um, you know, maybe we can take, like, Lord of the Rings, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like, that is, like, probably what we could call the grandfather of world building as we know it. I mean, for instance, the Simmerly is just one big book about world building. That is end up that ends up what it is. Um, like it definitely has like pol like um, you get on like political and um, commentary involved with it. But I think the main focus of it of that, for instance, is to create a really complex and interesting world. Like that, I think is what the cool thing about like Middle Earth and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff is, for instance. And that's like super super complex. Like. Like it's got like hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of pages devoted to it, um, but then you mentioned that the yeah, Avatar, like Blue People, Avatar, is fairly the straightforward. Simple allegory, right? Yeah, like so it's completely up to what the creators are going for, mm -hmm. what their vision is. Um, uh, in? Kind of unrelated, but do you know? a piece of media that tries to do this multi-story approach poorly. Poorly. Hmm. Um, let's see, this, um, so the multi I mean, to be fair, Octopath has some troubles with it, like, um, because, like, friends having eight separate stories can be a little bit weird for some people, but I think on a whole it does it well. Um, for one that does it poorly, okay, um, you'll probably laugh at this, um, Sonic Heroes. We'll say. I contest that. But, but here's the thing, though. Um, with that game, like, and we'll actually we'll tackle, this, <laughs> let's tackle it seriously now. Okay, okay. Um, because you have four different, like, so you have four different teams, and you go through the same exact levels in the same exact order with two different boss fights in the middle. Like, the, the levels themselves have different, you have, like, unique tastes to them. Yeah. But it's not that different. Like, it's not different enough, aside from one of the particular teams, like Team Chaotix. I Team say. Chaotix is the only good one, though. Yeah, right? yes. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Because it, like, that's the one that has the most variety. Nice. I think the problem, ha the problem occurs when you have different, like, different paths that don't have variety. I think that, because then it becomes stale very quickly. Wait, um, are they all in the same timeline? So, yeah, they actually, so, so in Sonic Heroes, the four teams go through the same areas at the same time, which is why some of them encounter each other. Yeah, they're boss fights. Oh, they're right? just... 
Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's like there's the good team, the Sonic team, <coughs> that's team the normal Bruce. game. Yes, yeah, so and then there's the evil team with the, the bats, right. the bat character, like, yeah, and the Sonic, robots. And oh, and Shadow, and uh, Edgy Sonic. Sonic Shadow. And that's like a hard one. And then yeah, that's like a hard one. And then there's Amy's team, which is like the easy team one. Bros, I think. And then, then there's. Oh, wait, that's controversial to call him easy. Uh, no, no it, it is. No, it, it, it was is the easy one. Really? Like, Team Sonic was supposed to be like kind of the medium, average, normal. Team Dark is supposed to be hard mode. Team Bros is easy. Like, like, like for all the gender girls, they're like. I know it's not great. <laughs> like, they're kind of. It was an era. Yeah. Oh, and then, but then Tim Chaotix was like. And Chaotix had like the random shit. They're yeah, it was like it was like instead of beating the level, you had to collect like fifteen elements or whatever, right? Yeah, that that was pretty cool because it added the variety. It makes you look at the level in a completely different way. And the characters themselves are also just better, but. I mean, right, of course. It's yeah, okay, no, but, but see, I, I don't know. If, team instinct. But I don't know if it's really <laughs> comparable to Octopath, right? Because like. You're supposed to beat all four, and then you get the true ending where they all combine or whatever. I've never beaten that game. I don't really know how it ends, but I know you like fight Metal Sonic or something. Yeah. Right? So, um, but like, uh, do you think it's really comparable to Octopath? Um, I think so. I mean, the context is different because that has more of a gameplay focus to it. Yeah. But even in that, it fails because. Of course. <laughs> well, no, because like by having four different teams that go through pretty much the same levels. Like, with the exception of one that actually does things differently, if you have three teams that are doing it essentially the same, yeah. that it fails to do the multi pathing even for a, con like a gameplay contest. That's fair. I mean, I, I didn't think the Sonic Heroes story, considering it was a Sonic game and what it was aiming to do, was bad. Like, I thought it was fun. Like, I was very curious about the Sonic, Metal Sonic. Oh, yeah, stuff, sure. Like the, but that has, that's, not, that's not like doing it. Yeah, exactly. Pass. That's not the point of the game. Yeah, that's what makes sense. Well, alright, so story wise, like, I actually really do enjoy like multi-directional stories yeah. where they show different aspects of the same world and then like in some moments it comes together. Yeah. Um, one episode that it, this reminds me of is a Rick and Morty episode. If you're under 18 on YouTube, don't don't look up Rick and Morty. And if you're over 18, please don't look up Rick and Morty. Yeah. <laughs> if you're exactly 18, it's fine. But there's, yeah. a, there's an episode in the latest season, season 3, about the citadel of Rick and Morty's. Like, where it's just a clones a bunch of Ricks, clones a bunch of Morty's. Oh. And that episode is structured out in different portions of the same city, and it's like, and like one portion is just a bunch of little Morty's, like, skipping school. While another portion is like a police, like buddy cop kind of thing, and then like you see these other stories, like cu they're cut out so that you jump through these stories. But I think the risk of doing that is usually you get lost of like what what was that story about or like what was that about. But I felt like that episode did, did it very well. Of course, there's only a time span of like what thirty minutes in animated shows, but. Um, I mean, considering <clears throat> all the characters look exactly the same. Yes, consi <laughs> considering yeah. they're legit, they're all the same they're characters. Clones. Well, they're not clones, it's more complicated. Oh, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a high enough IQ. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes. Oh, uh, God. Sorry, sorry. Okay. But, I mean, I really do enjoy yeah. stories like that. I'm just wondering if there was ever a time where Ooh. someone attempted that. I, I know a really bad example. Okay. You can agree with this, Sam. Fire Emblem Fates and Conquest yes. did it the we worst way possible. Yes. That was well, I, it's bad in every I, does, It doesn't help that the characters are... Okay, like, well the characters are already pretty lame. I mean, some of them, I actually like the <coughs> Conquest ones, they were fine. You know. Like, as a whole, right. Yeah, all, their best characters are the characters they just ripped off from previous games, which is not a great thing to do. Um, but yeah, like, the way they set up the story, not good. The story itself wasn't very good. And, it was like kind of a cash grab. So. That's a although I will say though it's a li that's a little bit of a different context because rather than it being multiple separate interweaving stories, it's more like alternate universe branching paths. It's more like a branching paths sort of situation rather than a multiple independent that's stories. True. So there's a I I agree with you that Fates does it badly, but it does a lot of things badly. <laughs> although the gameplay is good. Well, like, gameplay, gameplay is incredible. Gameplay is firing. Yeah. And it's like, of course it's good. And Conquest is uniquely good. Um, well, let's see, so, actually, I had an example that was, um, what was it, what was it? Oh. Actually, oh wait, um, actually there's, well, um, and uh, there's, it's actually an anime called Bakano. Um, which, which, Bakugan? Bakano. Bakugan? Uh, anyway. Wait, what's the uh, you know, Is that the, the uh, one, um, Dara Ra Ra's, like, the same? It's, it's a similar style. That's the one with the balls, right? That you roll, 
And it's like... <laughs> it's Bakugan. Oh, wait, that is Bakugan. <laughs> that, no. That's Bakugan. There's like... No, no. Toss is Beyblade. No. So, pretty much, like, the okay. idea of that is, like, that, like, it... Um, so it has, like, that one is an, uh, another one that features a bunch of different characters. They all have their own Chicago? sort of, like, their own sort of stories that take place in different time periods, although at the time, not sure what those time periods are. But they all end up intersecting in a bunch of different pretty cool ways. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, in, like, when I saw that, like, that was a really good example of how it was done. That because um, you were talking about how it can get confusing with non-distinctive characters. That when you have distinctive characters, it makes it easy to follow in terms of, okay, we're switching back to this storyline and what's going on over here. Um, yeah, so I think that's an example of what uh, one done fairly well. Uh, I'm sure there are a couple others that we could discuss. Here's a controversial hot the take. Detroit become human. Oh, okay. Ooh, Detroit become that, human. That, is, that, that, is, that is a game that does that, you're right. Interesting. Yeah. I, I haven't seen enough of Detroit. So, uh, one of my... I think you've seen enough. So one of <laughs> one of the most common complaints about the game. All right, so like there's this huge complaint about like how it portrays like racism yes. mm -hmm. and like how it portrays it too easily, whereas like it's actually more complex in real life. Yes. Um, there's that whole debate. But <clears throat> another complaint is that there are three main storylines. Mm -hmm. It's like as if it's like tripath traveler. Um, <laughs> but people only like Connor. The other two are boring as heck. Like yeah, you, you don't want to play like, like whenever you're Marcus. They're like no, no, skip this part. No, no, give give back Connor. Yeah, that's one of the um, the challenges of, of so multi character sick. separate things. You have to make like you have to make them all like. Sam, did yeah. you like all the Octopaths? No, I did not. I well, which I like. I liked okay. I liked all of them, but I liked some more than others. Okay, if you were to divide them up into like. A certain tiers. amount of tiers. tiers. Certain tiers. Okay, give me the tier list. S tier. Okay. okay What's geez. S tier? Uh, S tier in terms of like well, the, actually, like S tier trust. Oh, well, here's the question here. Um, so like, are we looking at the story and like yeah. like the world that they travel? Are we talking about like the story they told? Are we talking about the characters themselves? Because it's say? like they're very different rankings. I okay. Would but like, which one do you thought were like the most well done and like good? Like as a whole, from an whole objective story. sense. Um, let's see here. Um. I think so. If we have like, I'll say like maybe four tiers, okay. like S, A, B, and C, for instance. Okay. I think Primrose was A tier um, yeah. because like it was a really good build up, really good setup, good character, but it kind of dropped the ball at the end a little bit. Like all the themes it was setting up just kind of went all over the place. This is from a story perspective. I really love the places that it explored and all that sort of stuff. So that's um that's what makes it really cool. I think um, for me, Therian is. Um, the thief is C tier because I just don't like him that that much. He's okay, but not great. Um, and his sort of backstory is fine, but I felt it was a little contrived. But I don't know. Um, but it, that also explores some pretty cool places. So when I say C tier, that's like in the in the context. So like yeah. it was still good. It was still fine. Um, on it. Oh man, I think it's kind of hard because I haven't like thought about this beforehand. Like. Two and a I think Han's like A plus slash S tier, I think. Like she has a really solid. You just made four tiers and you invented a fifth tier. Like it's like in the middle. It's like in the middle on the border. There are only eight of them. Yes. Okay. You know, whatever. You know, like, two per tier. I can make a separate video on this if okay. I wanted to. But no, because um, that like Han's like growth as a character is really cool. Yeah. Um, all the places that she traveled to was really cool. Um, the the boss fights and enemies were really neat, and especially given the context of. Her like final boss fight that itself does put blows out of the water for me. Um, Cyrus is a solid A, like the um, the um, scholar. Um, he's just like on a whole good character, good story, like semi weak on the like in the ending theme, but the storytelling and the backstory is really great. Um, I don't even know uh, at this point. Um, Ophelia is really really good. Um, I think like S plus um, S for me. Like she just had. Consistent That's themes. The cleric, right? The cleric, yes. Yeah. She had consistent themes, um, good build up. You can kind of see it coming, but it doesn't take away from the impact, um, really. Yeah, and also, the final air, like, we're going to go back to world building, actually, on this, is that. So, like, let me tell you about, like, my experience in the game. 
is that, so I completed like a lot of chapter two slash three uh, chapters, uh, mostly the chapter two chapters. I was like, okay, I want some really good equipment, so I'm gonna, so I think I'm strong enough to be able to sneak in to the chapter four chapters, despite like, chapter towns, despite not being strong enough to take down the enemies fully, and just buy some overpowered equipment, go back and be able to do good um, stuff in the game. So I ended up going to Ophelia's chapter four town early, and it was the scariest thing in the game because whenever you talk to a character they just would not talk to you it would just be everyone would just give you dot dot dots like literally no it was just like a, i think it was called whisper mill it was just the creepy it's like a creepy pasta level like what the hell is going on here it, like i like i went in there saying okay this is like some cold ass shit right here turned out it actually was cold shit right over there so that was a really cool moment for me and just that alone really um bumped like i think um mm -hmm. made her story really really good for me and just that whole art in general. Uh, I don't even remember what I'm missing. Uh, uh, the the like, merchant. Let me just, let's see. The mer uh, merchant, solid. Um, a, just, um, good overall. I really like the character. I like the fights, like the, um, the relationships, all that sort of stuff. I think it was just overall really, really uh, good. What about the... Well, yeah, uh, Ulrich is actually very good. I put that probably, um, though, the warrior. Oh. Uh, he had, I think his his art, character art, was really, really well done. Um, the, the people you get to meet are really cool. The person you expect to be the final boss is actually like only like the chapter three boss, mm -hmm. which was like, that I did not expect that going in at all. Because turned out, like, like you thought he was a villain the whole time, but he's not actually a villain. And then you actually go and fight the real villain for the chapter four. And uh, I think you're missing someone. Oh, you, 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 you're missing the medicine man. Oh yeah, medicine man. Um, I think I'd also give him a non fusion. Okay, so if I understand this correctly, you have one S, Seven A's and one C. No, one A. The one A like, point so I, Oh yeah, one A point five. <laughs> so I have like two and a half uh, uh, S's, like uh, four and a half A's. Wait, like two and a half C. S's? Two and a half. Well, because it kind of like, like uh, who was it? I think someone I kind of had on the you, 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 I like, you, I like, you gave Primrose an S, and you gave. Hana I know I gave an A. Uh, no, Hana was like an A, a plus, a plus S. Oh. Primrose like an A. Anyway, that's like whatever. So, so, so in that way, like okay, so. Yeah. The, okay, my grand point is grand that point. like. So when when you actually had to rank these different stories, they were all pretty good, but they're still at least like comparatively speaking, the thieves one was kind of a dud. The rest were all equal, and then one or two were really good. But I'm not gonna say that's not. I, I'm not being objective. Okay. When I say that. I'm gonna but just like, say do, that right do, now. That's, do you think in objective sense, they're all the stories are created equal? Because like, like okay. no, no, absolutely not. Because because I'm thinking okay, here, here here's a fun situation where things should be equal, but they're not. Right. So if anyone here has played Breath of the Wild, oh, okay. there is this part of the game where you have to go to like the four towns, the four big dungeons, right. and there's like a little arc you, you go through, right? Uh, the, the one with the fish people, what are they called? Zora? Zora, yeah. yeah. You, that, that arc is so in-depth, you meet like Prince Sidon, there's like a backstory, it's like all these cutscenes, it's really awesome. And then, and then when you go to like all the other towns, there's nothing. You just, you, just, you, just, you, you just show up there, you fight the Divine Beast, you get the only other town that has like, is like the Gerudo people. And what's really wild to me is that the Gerudo town and the Zor the fish people are the only towns you would go to first, presumably, and then the other ones are the towns you go to second. And like when I say that, I realize, wow, of the four major the four major things you do in the game, there are only four of them, right? The they were not one. created equal. Like the no, first no. thing, you had nothing for the Rito. Like you just got no lore, no backstory, you just show up no and you fly right. It's 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 I don't like when games do that, because I think that's like it it kinda speaks to like like, like, there's no reason to have that kind of inequality. Right. Um, like, 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 for example, do, do you think they put the same amount of time and resources into all eight of the stories? Oh, yeah, I, I think that... That's what, true, right? I think that's true. Oh, I yeah, think that's it's just... I think time. it all ends up coming down to personal taste, I think. That's fair. Because all of them, they have different tones, different themes, so on and so forth. Because each of the characters have their own different <coughs> backstories and problems and whatnot. So I think that it was well done in that sense. I just, if I, have, I, just I just have a... I have a tendency to hate the pretty white, uh, the pretty white hair boys. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I'm gonna talk. Maybe someone else should start. Gosh, yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, someone like else should spread their discussion. Now, like I mean, honestly, any sort of experience that you've had, like oh. with like story world in any sort of media whatsoever, like let's talk about it. Yeah, oh yeah, wait, um, yeah, we were talking about Homestuck. Yeah, Homestuck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> the, 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 aren't there like multiple things in Homestuck or something? It's I don't like know. I, I would never read Homestuck. How so many I are Zodiac? No, like, but, no, but like, in honesty though, I mean, like, I'm Homestuck, I, I, I don't know enough about it. But, like, 
Like, but Holmes, I, it was a craze for a reason. So yeah. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. Like, so like, wait, so wait, Matt, did you at least like talk about like the premise, like, or at least like, like what the pre like the premise? Oh, of the like story the multiple, you don't mind. like not the premise of the whole thing, but like the, the story, multiple storyline set up. Like, how, it how wasn't it? really multiple storylines. It was just like, what happens when you have what fifty characters? Um, more than eight. Yeah. More than eight. <laughs> wow, nice. Um, so there were some like that didn't get much for right. obvious reasons. Um, like half of them. Obviously. Right. Because you can't focus that yeah. much on fifty. But like but I was like, like I guess they all had their own different arcs and they like you like got to see the world like through yeah, a bunch of different points. They were of view. very rarely separated. So it's kind of hard to see them as different arcs. So it seems like something like that is much more focused on the character interactions. Yeah. Like so actually I guess that, that might, that's a decent thing to talk about. It's like when like when you have different characters you can focus on like pretty I think I'd say there are two different categories you can focus on. Like the character act interactions between them, Ashbath definitely doesn't do that because each of those stories are completely separate from one another in terms of characters interacting. But you can also focus on viewing the same world and the same thing through a bunch of different lenses, which is what Octopath does. Something like Homestuck, as we mentioned, is focused more focused on the character interactions. Um, like what's it, like I guess another example of this might be uh, or some of these other things I'm talking about. Um, um, okay, how, how, how about, let, let, let's think of an example not for like multiple stories, but like for the world building versus storytelling dichotomy. Yeah. Like, what do you think is another game that, <coughs> that like focuses on world building versus storytelling? Uh, focus on world. Well, a lot of, like, you could make the argument that a lot of those open ended games do. You could argue that maybe Breath of the Wild. Oh, yeah, that's the ultimate example. <laughs> what am I, by the way, not that question. Like, like I, I haven't played it, but I mean. Um, what? On Breath of the Wild. I haven't played Breath of the Wild. Breath but from what I know of it, it, like, it, like, because of the freedom it gives you. You're exploring the world, and that's like the main focus of the game. A lot of, like a lot of those sort of Zelda games, you could argue focus on that. Um, a link, um, Majora's Mask for sure, worlds. right? Oh, Majora's Mask, absolutely. It's the ultimate. I think, like for instance, like going back to side quests, Majora's Mask is riddled with a ton of side quests. And that's the best, I think that's the best way, or at least Ooh. the most common way. Are you proposing an empirical measure of world building? No, no, not the best way. But it's, it's, but it's one of the most, it's one of the most consistently <laughs> used. Value w. It's one of the most consistently used and one of the most common ways for world building. Because they're not inherently necessary to get to your end goal, but they let you find out more about the world that you might not have otherwise known. Majora's Mask is riddled with those sort of things. I think like um, the like the mar um, the marriage couple. Oh side yeah, quest. like that's like one of the one of the. It is a weird, really weird side quest, and probably not okay in context. But but it's it's a really cool it's like it's a cool story on its own. It, like it really in talking about giving each of the side characters their own depth and own backstories and personalities. That's like one that does something like that extremely well. Um, yeah. Zelda games aren't like in general like they have, they are, they just in general are not story focused as much. I mean, some of them more so than others. And I guess maybe with the exception, I think Skyward Sword would be one of my exceptions. The DS games, all the all the handheld Zelda games are entirely story driven. They are entirely story driven. Except for like a link but to the but for instance, let's take um, let's actually take Phantom Hourglass for a moment. With Phantom Hourglass is hundred percent story driven. Yes, it's story driven, but it encourages exploration. As it does it though. It does. Does it really? Uh, like, I, it just, it, it, it gives you a lot of freedom in terms of where you can travel to. Yeah, I suppose, but like, it doesn't, basically everywhere you can travel, like, there's an entire quarter of the map dedicated to a story arc, and you never go back 1500% of the game. Oh, uh, wait, I'm The yeah. top right quarter of the map. I, it's been a while. Like, I, like, I play Phantom Red Goss too much for right. a human <laughs> being, so. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand, like, it felt like a game. It, I, feel, I would call it a faux exploration. Like okay. there was ex exploration of the game mechanic, but it was all story driven exploration. Right. It's not like Wind Waker where you explore for exploration's sake. Right. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, yeah, Sp and Spirit Tracks kind of breaks so like that's definitely. And, you, there's no argument. It does it well though. Like it's it, it, Spirit Tracks. Don't get me wrong. It does it well. Um, but because like just the fact that you are literally on rails, <laughs> you're literally on rails. Yeah. Like that, I mean, it just inherently removes the exploration that you have and puts the emphasis in that story. I wouldn't say linear because you can do side things and all that sort of stuff, but like the play, like in terms of where you're going along the story, you, that is linear though. Um, I think it's good time to wrap this up. We probably extended pretty long, but 
Um, if there are any um, things, I'd love to talk about them after this. And thank you for coming to watch. Don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Something tough for me. <laughs>